it is a huge honor today to be interviewing a, a, a real role model of mine, Eric Jackson. I, I feel like we're, uh, we have so much in common. We're both DDS. We're both masters in the Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, we both have our fellowship in International Congress Oral Plantology and, and on and on and on and on. And um, I, um, I have really gone to school following you on social media too. I mean, you just, you, you were the first person I know who just, you just did it all right. It was, uh, your <clears throat> social media posts are educating and informative. I, I always want to read them. And I, I can just imagine how your patients are wondering, how are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind words. That's fantastic. I mean, coming from someone like yourself with, uh, admittedly, some of the top top posts around uh, means a lot to me. Thank you. Oh, hey. And uh, so I, I want to start off. Uh, I mean, there, there's so many things I can talk to you about. I mean, you're, you're a, a master clinician. You're an implantologist. You're um, a successful businessman. You're, you're the, the top 0.01% social media marketing that I've ever seen. And I, I've been on social media pretty big time since, since uh, 1998. Um, First of all, I think I want to start is was getting you the you have so many initials behind your names. Talk to these young kids. Um, was it important looking back? Was er, joining the Academy of General Dentistry and earning your fellowship, and then going on to earn your mastership? Looking back, was that a good idea for you? Well, it was immensely important. Uh, you know, I've met, I've been very fortunate to meet some of the best people in dentistry through the AGD, and uh, you know, I, I was very blessed. I went to. University of uh, Illinois at Chicago for dental school. But in the end, I, I'm sure you can attest, that only starts you out. It's your, it's your basic building blocks. And then you got to start kind of expanding what really interests you and what's the real world way of doing things. And, and I found all that through you know, a variety of ways through the AGD, mentorship and uh, all the different classes. And then you know, all of a sudden you start stringing a few classes together and you say, oh, wow, what's that fellowship about? And maybe I could get uh, a nice goal for myself. And then that becomes mastership and so on and so forth. Uh, continuing education and the people that you meet, that you through it, are a fantastic, fantastic thing for me in my career. I, I look back and I think that was the single game changer I did in dentistry. And, yeah. I, and um, I, I tell a funny story because when I was getting my uh, uh, fellowship in the Academy of General Dentistry, back in the day you had to have 500 hours and then pass an all-day exam and practice five years. So it was about 100 hours a year for five years. And they kept wanting me to take these classes and subjects that I didn't do. do. I didn't do orthodontics. I didn't do implants. So I complained and to my local, and they said no. And I went all the way up to the very top. And this guy, this older guy just said, um, he said, Howard, you, you got to be cross-trained. Yeah. And, you know, you, um, Carl Misch says that he didn't become a great implantologist if he wouldn't have had his foundation in removable. He said what got him interested in implantology was that these people putting dentures over implants and the implants were breaking and they were blaming on the implants. And he said, no, it was, you, you don't understand how to make a denture. You got to get the bite first. That's right. and, and if you, you, if you uh, put a bunch of implants in and the bite bites horrendous and, and they, they don't function properly, then everything's going to whack. And he credits mastering dentures as his groundwork to master, mastering implantology. I've always said it's all about reverse, especially with implants. It's reverse engineering the case. Whether you, you, know, you kind of figure out your destination and then you bring it back to where you are now, it really helps to kind of set the path for the patient. And, and the, the, the treatment plan just kind of flows out of you. You know, all right, well, I need to have implants here, here, and here if possible. How are we going to do that? And we can kind of figure that out that way. And I don't want to um, piss off a bunch of people, but uh, I will. Some of these things that uh, these TM MD experts say you can tell they've never done one case of orthodontics. I mean, about about at least twenty percent of everything they say just goes out the window if they just did a few orthodontic uh, classes and treatments. Well, and that's the benefit of having the fellowships and the masterships of the AGD behind you. You know, you're able to sit in a lecture or, or listen to a uh, listen to a presentation and really kind of decide what works for you. And after you've heard hours and hours and hours of this, you're able to kind of figure out what jives with your own philosophy. And, and uh, I know I'm the son of an orthodontist. Uh, oh, and I, said, I should have made that comment. <laughs> no, but, but you're 100% correct. You have to be multidisciplined because if you don't appreciate what the orthodontist can do you know, in their wide scope, then how can you apply even some of that as a general dentist? 
And the concepts of you know just tooth movement, for example, whether it's you're doing Invisalign or you're doing the veneering cases that you instantly straighten people's teeth, that's really important. It's the foundation that's just no longer uh, no longer are you locked into one avenue of dentistry. It's absolutely melded more than it ever has been before. And, and the MAGD also set the groundwork for my mind for Dental Town because as I was joining the MAGD back in '87. And I was realizing I didn't I, that I was thinking when I would get back from these courses that the most I learned was from the people I meet and with having lunch with them and going to the bar afterwards and Absolutely. having cheeseburgers and watching the football game and it's like I would go back and I'd have six pages from the bar of notes and yeah. four pages from Dale and that, that's when I saw the internet is that if we could just all get together and start talking we would all win. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, dental town in itself is, is, is essentially the exact mode of what you want. You want to be able to rub elbows with people who are better than you and different than you. And then in turn, once you get better, then you can rub elbows with somebody who needs your assistance. I mean, that's the, I mean, I'm sure one of the main reasons why you founded it. It's why it's such a fantastic resource to the profession, because whether you're God's gift to dentistry or you just graduated yesterday, there's something on there for everybody. And it's no different than rubbing elbows with your local uh, organizations or your regional. Or in this situation, you could be rubbing elbows with somebody in Malaysia on Dental Town and really learn how they're doing it and vice versa also. And then to you young kids I want to, you know, that just got out of school, I want to remind you that um, we all know what we know, but we'll, we don't know what we don't know. And I'm sure a thousand years from now, a lot of everything we believe is going to look crazy. Oh, absolutely. I've always joked. My grandkids are going to laugh and say, Grand Grandpa, you, you, you screwed titanium screws into somebody's head. Why didn't you just grow the tooth in a Petri dish like everybody else does these days? I'm like, you know, but we're cutting edge right now. It all changes, and especially these days, so rapidly. With the dissemination of information and the overall knowledge pool just doubling, uh, what is it, annually or every six months, it just really makes it all the more important to stay on top of your stuff as a dentist. So – the youth, um, there, there's a lot of people talking about the oral systemic link, that the mouth is connected to the rest of the body. And uh, um, do, you, do you think that importance is growing in, in our um, lifetime right now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the, between the classic topics of diabetes and, and, and cardiac issues, but now it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's the link between dentistry and medicine is, is I'm sorry, the, the gap between dentistry and medicine is blurring more than ever before. I mean, in my office, I'm proud. We, we, we've branched out and, and we do things from genetic testing and the salivary genetic testing when applicable. You know, uh, what else? Um, brush biopsies. I mean, simple little things that really, really benefit patients. Why not offer a multidisciplinary approach that encompasses not just the multidisciplines, the multidisciplines of dentistry, but also that of some of medicine? You know, a biopsy brush is not that technical, especially when you have a fantastic team behind the actual histopathological report. You're in business, and you're able to really help a lot of people. And I mean, it happened last week. She, woman didn't know what this bump was. Right there, you can help and start getting some information uh, a couple hours, a couple of days later, rather. Do you want to go into more details about that? Because I'm sure 99% of the listeners have never done any salivary genetic testing or... Oh. Sure, it's fantastic. I mean, it's it's literally my big thing. Th three things in dentistry, I always preached. I mean, it's dentistry is such a philosophical type uh, field now. If I can do something that's high impact or high results, low cost and low invasiveness, if you can get those three things, then you've hit your trifecta, right? Uh, salivary salivary testing, literally, you swish with <laughs> you swish with a solution, you spit in a cup. And you send it to a laboratory, and they're able to, to decipher a, a million different things from, uh, well, is there HPV present? What types of strains of HPV are, is it present? Um, that's wonderful for throat cancer. Um, you can also do it for pe uh, periodontal type issues. That's stubborn scaling root planning case that doesn't respond. Well, there's a couple reasons why it could, and one of them could be some really nasty bacteria of certain strains that are kind of resistant, more or less, to traditional SRP methods. So you have to use a combination method of perhaps uh, some antibiotics or a laser or, you know, a combination of both. Really kind of giving you an extra step because if you know what the name of the bug is, well, then you can go after them a little bit more uh, focused. 
And it's interesting to me where, um, you know, when I got out of school in 87, um, AIDS was just coming out big time. And now here it is 28 years later, and the world is just barely waking up to the fact that babies are not born with these bugs, and we yeah. transmit them from their uh, caregivers, mainly, mainly their mother. And Absolutely. some of these people that have untreatable peritoneal disease are going home and kissing and training saliva every night with some husband who hasn't been seen by yeah. a dentist for 20 years. And it's just not even dawning on the dentist or the patient to say, you know, we, we need to get your husband in here. I mean, it's kind of silly because if, if you were treating her every three months for chlamydia, you eventually yeah. say, you know, who, who are you sleeping with? And she, if she said, my, just my husband, it's like, well, we think he's got the bug too. Uh, yeah, you got to talk to him. So that, um, that um, salivary test, what, what company are you using? I use Aura Risk. Aura Risk. Is a, yeah, O-R-A, Risk. Yeah, it's a fantastic company. They do quite a few different things via the saliva. Uh, like I mentioned, HPV, um, periodontal type testing. Real, real nice. And, so, and uh, the interesting thing about those bugs is um, real Christians saying that um, every three months they discover a new species of bug in the mouth. Absolutely. Every three months. And, well, and the nice part is you've got trained professionals who can help you identify that. And then they figure out what targets it. And you don't have to do it for every case. But, you know, instead of just seeing someone limp along in somewhat healthy perio for years and, and eventually equals a slow decline, you can really nail down that those toughest percents of cases. So did your dad ever forgive you for not being an orthodontist? <laughs> yeah, no, I, but my father, was, he, he is fantastic. And, you know, he's, he still teaches down at the uh, orthodontic department at UIC. And never once did he ever push me towards it. Um, in school, I was always drawn to the uh, exercises where we basically had a treatment plan. And, and that's kind of what kind of convinced me that I belong along more in general dentistry. Kind of then was the genesis towards all the different multidisciplinary approach and the, and the AGD fellowship classes and things like that. It's, it's I enjoy sitting down with somebody fresh and deciphering what they need. Maybe it's one filling, maybe it's a, it's a hundred million different things. But because there's so many, um, you know, for lack of a better term, bullets in my gun, right? In our office, we can do almost 80% of all dental uh, procedures. We still refer out plenty. But the nice part is we have deep, intimate knowledge of everything, all the different disciplines, and that really transfers into the initial treatment plan. Because as always, the old cliche, the general dentist, whether uh, he or she's doing the actual treatment or not, is always the quarterback of the case. And you're able to then direct where needed and, more importantly, advocate for the patient. Uh, they, you're their home dentist. You need to be able to translate the dentalese into, into layman. And well, it works out really nicely that way. Well, you know, maybe this would be a great time to ask you uh, quite one of the biggest controversies among practice management consultants is, you know, the patient calls up and uh, the number one reason they call a dental office is that they, they want a cleaning. And so if a new patient calls up you and you're the multidisciplinary person and, and says, I want a new patient cleaning. How do you handle that? Uh, the answer is essentially I've got our certain ways. Uh, I always like sitting down for a, a comprehensive exam first. Uh, we can do, if necessary, obviously a limited, a quick exam, but that won't get you into the cleaning department. It won't get you into the hygiene department. Um, there's And just simple patient education. It's you know, the fact that if you're blowing people's mind when you tell them, well, we need to figure out what kind of cleaning you need. What do you mean there's, what, there's multiple types of cleanings? I didn't know there's multiple types of cleanings. And you go through the different types of cleanings, uh, different levels of invasiveness, et cetera. And just that alone, just being able to sit down and explain that one fact to them, let alone the rest of it. Like my, my comprehensive exams are about 90 minutes long. Can, you go, just, can you go over that, the, the specifics of it? I, I bet a lot of people would want to hear that. Sure. What, what is the new patient? If I called up your office and I said, I want to, I want to see Eric, Eric because uh, – He's Absolutely. the same name as my first son, Aaron, Eric Ferran, yep. and uh, so I chose you just on your name, Eric. Um, what, what happened? So you scheduled – walk us through that. You scheduled me for 90 minutes, and, and, how, and, and how, does, how does that actually ha work? What happens first in, in general, the order? Of course, they, sit, they come in the office. We sit down actually in this room where I'm at, my consultation room, and myself, the patient, and typically my assistant, we just sit down and we kind of just get to know each other a little bit. I need to know where you want me to take you. Uh, what your major goals are, uh, your past experiences, pros and cons to those, you know, your likes, dislikes about the, the past experiences. So that way we can hopefully, you know, get, get a glimpse of you in a snapshot uh, in the time, you know, just we got to be able to build. I always say at that appointment, we're, we're not just taking one little look at you today. We're putting the very first brick 
of a 40-year wall. You know, we're going to be building a big giant house, and this is the cornerstone appointment. We need to make sure we're very thorough, thorough, and all things come from today. So then after that, we sit down for a good, you know, 10, 15, 20 minutes, or longer for whatever it takes. That's why we like to have that much time. Um, we'll go to the operatory, of course, radiographs, photographs. Uh, uh, and a big thing for me, I mean, I'm very interactive with the patients, I think. It's very important to be that way because I'm a visual, a visual learner. So I've got my big screen TV. It's a good 40-inch uh, TV up in front uh, that's linked to my, my computer behind them. So that way, all the photos, all the x-rays, if I see something that's interesting, it can be put up right there, and it becomes almost a mini lecture. You know, I'll say I'm, dis I'm, I'm kind of deputizing the patients into, you know, almost a dental degree. They need to know not all dentistry, but their mouth dentistry. And it really helps with, obviously, appreciation of what we do as a dentist uh, on a daily day basis, but also what's going on in their mouth. Maybe they've got stuff to do. Maybe it's totally pristine. But there's always things to talk about, I mean, in, in someone's mouth, whether it's a, a craze line here or a little bit of a recession over there. Maybe they're brushing too hard. Maybe they're grinding. And the different links between things. We look at, you know, obviously head and neck, and we talk a lot about tonsils and, and obstructive sleep apnea and then pediatric dentistry. Uh, it's a really wonderful, there's no one set conversation, which is why that's my favorite appointment. I love doing comprehensive exams because it's back and forth, just like we're doing here. I mean, it's, there's no there's no set script. There's no set, uh, I mean, of course, there's bullet points you have to hit. But really, it's just very honest conversation with a patient. And that's what really, that's what makes 40 years of enjoyment between a doctor and a patient, I think. Yeah, and I, I think that <clears throat> separate that that new patient meeting the dentist first is Absolutely. It, it just totally differentiates your practice as opposed to scheduling with a hygienist and and just get, getting their cleaning and their profi and 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 what's also funny is the number one reason new patients come into my office and left their last dentist the number one reason in my office and it, it's almost solid for twenty years well I just wanted a regular cleaning they said I needed a deep cleaning. So obviously mm -hmm. they didn't earn the trust, the respect. Yeah. They didn't show them the X-rays. They they, they they didn't understand it. They didn't believe it. Um, I I just passed on a um on a uh, an, an attorney uh, because I uh, was setting something up and um, he he couldn't explain it to me or my my president. I mean we listened to him for one hour and then when he left it's like okay do you understand Will's um I don't I mean I I'm I'm not dumb but I should be. Smart enough true. after one hour, I should understand a will for my four boys. I, I, you know what I mean? I, just, I didn't understand it. I've been very blessed. I've got a patient Rolodex full of what I call high dental IQ patients, right? They're very smart, but they're not dentists. They're not in the dental field. They can get it. They absolutely understand what we're talking about because in the end, dentistry, whether it's fancy implant dentistry, like you said before, whether you're building like Carl Misch backwards the front, but it's still just building. It's, it's, it's construction. You know, what's a post? It's like a piece of rebar. Lots of analogies. Intelligent patients can really get that because they want to. They want to be part of it. They don't want to just lay there and say, fix me, doc. That's not, that's not what the modern patient, I find, uh, desires these days. And I think, uh, I think a lot of people have heard at the, the, uh, the saying that journalists say all the time, explain it like you're explaining it to a sixth grader. And a lot of people sit there and say that they, they comes off that, oh, well, that you mean explain like they're dumb? And it's not that they're dumb. It's like, I'm a dentist. I'm not a plumber. I'm, yeah. not, I, I'm, not, I'm not a mechanic. When I, when I take my car into the shop, he has to explain to me like a sixth grader understanding of auto mechanics. I mean, I grew up playing Barbie dolls with five sisters. I never changed the oil, transmission. I, I don't know any, any of that stuff. And I play the music so loud, I never hear the engine warning signs or, you know, just if the light comes on, I take it in there and I need them to explain it to me, you know, like a sixth grader. Um, so, so, um, a big fan of these podcasts, I mean, and, you know, thousands of them listen to this are pretty much juniors and seniors in dental school, or they just been out five years. I mean, that, those are the podcast people. So, um, you've been out a long time and you've made great achievements. What multidisciplinary skill sets should they learn? I mean, would you just recommend they join the FAGD and do all 16 deals or, or what, what, what do you, what do you think some? Um, but what 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 areas like like I, I think of you as a implantologist I really do I would yeah. I, I think Whatever. of you as an implantologist do you, do you think these kids should uh, start signing up for uh, hands-on surgical courses and learn how to place implants or 
Um, do, do you do molar endo? What type of multiple scenario do you do? Well, the thing is, you have to find out what you love. You know, I, I don't, I love, I love certain things and actually it's most things. That's why it ends up being such a large basket to choose from. But, you know, if I had to pick one thing and I've, I've talked to students, whenever I gave lectures in front of students locally and whatnot, and even some study clubs, it's always, if you're not, if you're not socket grafting, if you're the general dentist that can pull a tooth, every general dentist should be able to pull a tooth. But if you're not actually placing and doing socket preservation, at the same time, well, then I, I feel that that's something that you, you first off, should, should be doing. So that skill is absolutely imperative, I think. So anybody, anytime somebody comes in my office, it's excluding wisdom teeth, they're always getting to talk about preservation of the bone, preservation of the socket, even if they're not implant candidates, because at some point, they might choose to, in the future. Well, now what? Now you've wasted the most precious time to place that and preserve that socket. So coming out of school... I mean, obviously, these days especially, it's all about differentiation. If you can differentiate your, yourself from the, from the guy or girl down the street, uh, and it doesn't change for you and me, frankly, um, then you need to be able to do something a little bit different. Being able to provide the service of pulling a tooth and placing the graft in there in a wonderful, simple manner makes the world of difference for future treatment. And That's, will do you mind walking us through your socket grafting technique? And, um, sure. And... and, and um, they always like to hear specifics, like, you know, like when you say bone, bone grafting, like, like what material, what name brand, where would they order it? You know, just, can you walk us through your bone grafting technique? Sure. I'm a big fan. I mean, I've, I've tried a lot of different ones, but it still comes back to the, I, I use the way I was trained on it. Um, it's a one-to-one -one mix of periglass and uh, demineralized freeze-dried bone. Um, I know there's, you can use your putties and you, I've tried a whole bunch and there's different sizes and, and uh, you know, not every socket graft is exactly the same. I mean, sometimes you'll, you'll break out your, your uh, A or versus your B. But in general, I like a mixture of, of periglass and, and demineralized freeze-dried. Um, it works very, very nicely. Um, it's tried and true. I've done thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And I'm not a big fan of being the first on the block to... <laughs> You know, experiment more or less on people. Oh, I know. You know, if it's been out, there's a, the, lo, uh, the the eye clinic that's there. There's a wonderful, we, it's got the Wheaton Eye Clinic in, uh, down the street from my office here and it's in one town over. And I know they do some of the best work in the state, let alone, let alone the, the region. But they don't offer certain things until they've been out of the market for seven or ten years. That's just company policy. Now, I don't have a hardcore company policy like that, but the, but the rationale is very sound. You know, oh, we got a great new product. Why don't you try it out? You, 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 mean, you mean product test on my patients? No, these are my patients. I, I, why don't you tell me some studies, and then we'll go from there. You know, and that's, again, dental town. Some, some people are more uh, apt to try new things. Some people are a little more conservative, and I can learn from them just by going on there. And that's just a wonderful way of just being able to communicate. Oh, my so, God. When I got yeah. out of 87, I mean, I've gone through, you know, cement and dye cores with uh, Duralon. <laughs> you know, I went through, uh, when I started getting into implants, uh, I got my fellowship admissions student. and we were replacing HA coated. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, I, I got burned so many times that I think when I turned about 40, I said, you know what, until, until other colleagues have done it for five years successfully, I'm not even going to listen. I mean, I, I, I paid my dues. Totally agree. Because in the end, even if you're correct, there's always that one that's, ah, that's just not as great a result as I would like. And, you know, that's not the, what you want to say. That's not the kind of office I want to run. And so in the end, from the very get-go, from the time I started the office, I decided I'm not going to do that. Okay. It's going to end up being tried and true. Okay. Is Periglass just P-E-R-I-G-L-A-S-S dot -S com? Periglass dot com? I believe so, yes. And yeah. where, where, where do you buy that from? Uh, we, get, we get our Periglass from – actually, we've, we just recently switched. Um, the Periglass and the Bone – for a while, I was getting through Strauman because I used Strauman um, implants I, I actually exclusively. I really like their product. Um, again, that's a whole other, obviously, a whole other podcast, I'm sure, for you. But uh, I've always enjoyed how the Strauman uh, restore. And, out, and as a restorative dentist, that's obviously imperative. I mean, it's not just the surgical portion we're putting in there. It's how do they look? Uh, are you able to make some beautiful custom abutments? Um, and how well do they stand the test of time? So for me... You know, there's a lot of different places where you can get your bone um, and your periglass, for that matter. But if it comes down to, I, I've always gone through my rep because it's one more reason why you really have a great strong rep. Um, you know, reps these days are sometimes being replaced by PDF files, and 
And that's okay to some extent. It's technology, but it sure is nice to have a living, breathing human being who really knows his or her stuff. So uh, you, right? you, you, you're talking about the Strawman rep? Yeah, yeah, Strawman rep. Yeah, you know what? I, I would say, you know, I, I'm kind of confused by dentists because they, they should be really, really smart, but they're not really classically trained in business yeah. or economics, which is why I went back and got my MBA. But, you know, uh, Implants Direct said, okay, we're going to go lower cost by selling yeah. them online. And then so everybody starts buying them because they're lower in cost, and then they all start complaining about not having a rep. And it's like, are, are, are you not right in the head? No, and, 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 and now now they're putting reps in, and it's like uh, – and, and their parent company, Danaher, bought no bug here. But I'll, I'll say this. You know, you, you can buy the cheapest implant from countries all around the world, from Russia to Korea to Israel, whatever. But when I meet a dentist like you, like Tarun Agarol, like so many people that are actually implementing it and placing a lot of implants, they all pay higher dollars for their implants because they value that relationship with the rest. So I call it just – getting her done. It's kind of like why I have a personal trainer knock on my door at five o'clock because the first 50 years didn't happen. And I thought, okay, right. if it didn't happen the first 50 years, probably not going to happen in the second half either. So right. I, 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 it, I, I don't really care what we do at five o'clock. What I'm paying for is getting her done. Yeah. And, and the people that are getting her done placing, like how many implants would you say you place a month or a year? Or? Oh, I don't know for that, but in general, it's been I guess in the last, uh, what, in the last decade, it's over 2,000 implants. I mean, easily. And, 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 yeah. and any time I meet someone like that, they pay for higher quality implants for the, for, for the rep. Now, how much of this is for their – now, is Strawman – I always get mixed up. Are they from Sweden or Switzerland? Uh, Swiss. Sw Switzerland, yeah. Switzerland. So now, are you, are you liking Strawman because you like the local rep or do you like Strawman for technical reasons? I used to place, uh, well, early in my career, I was at an implant center exclusively. So all we were doing was implants, big cases, things like that. And upon you know, realization that after I was there for a couple of years, I realized I missed a lot of general dentistry. And then my, my true calling was to really integrate things, integrate uh, implants into uh, the day-to-day -day cosmetic dentistry that we're all kind of familiar with, a family dentist. Um, so in the end, I chose the Strauman company because – yeah, they had a fantastic rep, but, you know, I was also looking at Nobel, but for me, the big thing was just, I just felt right in my hands, you know, and sometimes, you just, and I know that sounds a little wishy-washy, but just sometimes down to, you just kind of, you're picking up the Nike or the Reebok, and you're like, wow, these are both great. Uh, I kind of like this one more. I don't know why. It just looks nice to me, or it feels nicer in my hand or on my foot, and I think that's kind of exactly what happened. It was just kind of, you were drawn to it, and, uh, you know, fortunately, you're choosing between apples and apples in that situation. I mean, obviously, two of the largest implant companies in the, in the nation or in the, in the world. Um, so you can't go wrong. Just a matter of what works well in your hand. Like so many things that we do, you know, do you prefer uh, a material or B material? You know, do you like, you know, 3M or you like Bisco or, you know, that kind of stuff. And, and they're all wonderful. It's just a matter of what you kind of prefer. A little more viscous here, a little bit less that. And I, and I really think that's part of the Part of the hardest part about coming out, like you said, for the first five years, uh, the podcast, you know, they're all young dentists. you got to try a bunch of stuff in a responsible manner, like we said, without testing on people. But you also have to be able to know what works well in your hands. And the best way to do that is hook up with some really good, experienced dentists, see what they use, and try out. So that way you're not necessarily um, randomly picking through the, uh, the Henry Schein or the Patterson book. You know, about 10 years ago, I was having dinner with uh, Gordon Christian and the CEO of Dentsply at the Chicago airport, uh, John Miles, and he said something to me very profound. He said, um, he said, dentists are very brand loyal because they have so many procedures that they have to do that if something works in their hands, they're not going to change because of an ad or a flyer or a discount or whatever because they have so many things that they're trying to improve in another area. If they're, if they're taking an impression and it works – They'll use the same impression material for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. He, he, he used to always believe that dentists were more brand loyal, brand loyal than any group of people out there. Just yeah. because you know, you're always working on the weak, weakest link in the chain, you're sure as hell not going to start changing what's been working for you for 5, 10, 20 years just because they got a new color or a flavor. Exactly. And, and because – and I think that you know, obviously dentists has, dentistry has uh, – and dentists in general – uh, have you know certain reputations and whatnot, but dentists are really good people. I think in a large part, we're not trying to 
well, this will get you five seconds faster. I don't care about five seconds faster. I literally couldn't care any less. I want to make sure, is your new product just as good as the one you're replacing? And if not, I, you know, then you can keep your five seconds. I, I don't I don't need that. I know. I, I love Dennis. I really do. I mean, uh, you know, whenever you stay in, a, stay in a dentist home, the thing that I always notice the most when you spend night in a dentist home, they always have a hundred nonfiction books. And yeah. whenever you stay in someone who's not a dentist or a physician or a lawyer, they have People Magazine and Fifty Shades of Grey and Dentists are just smart. They're well-read. And since they're classically trained in all the basics of science, whether it's math, physics, chemistry, or biology, they're actually really spot on in areas of science outside their uh, expertise, whether it be global warming or, or mercury. Uh, I, I want to ask you about that. There was a uh, – well, well, first of all, I need to go back to um, soccer grafting. Um, do you put a membrane over the top of that and suture that in? or Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Uh, what, what, what makes you do it and what makes you not – well, I mean, in the end, most of the time, I'll do a, uh, I'll do a, like a PTFE type membrane. Uh, nothing, you know, pretty traditional. I don't really use that many of the titanium mesh. Um, and then sometimes I'll just place the, place the traditional uh, periglass. I'm sorry, not periglass, a traditional gel foam over the top of it. If it's a real small little fella, it works out really well. Um, you know, there's pros and cons to each one, and you, gotta, and you have to pick the right scenario, of course, just like everything we do. But really, it's a... Uh, you know, you get great results, and as long as, I mean, in the end, as long as your graft, especially the particulates that I use, as long as it stays in there, you're going to be getting some great, great results. And some listener might not have understood what PTFE means. Uh, essentially, it's plumber's tape, right? That's the whole idea. A nice little plumber's tape over the top, but uh, a whole lot more expensive than medical grade. So it's going to be able to keep that, uh, keep that material in place because if you, unless you're getting primary closure and actually getting the the gums, the gingiva, et cetera, to close over and hold it in, well, it's, it's, a, it's a particulate. It's going to be like sand falling out of – I always compare it to like a sand falling out of a coffee cup. Uh, you don't want that. You want it to keep the, keep the coffee in the coffee cup. So you got to cork it off, and so that way you're in good shape. And how do you, what, how do you charge for that, and does insurance pay anything? Oh, you, you know what? Be, the number one – well, actually, there's a lot of reasons I'm blessed, but my staff here is fantastic about – I mean, we can bill out to medical sometimes. Um, not always, but sometimes. And, yeah, more and more dentist, uh, dental insurances are covering implant placement and socket grafting. Uh, probably more the implants, I guess, right now than the socket grafting. But, you know, in the end, I, I, I price my, both my implants and my socket grafting, especially my socket grafting, uh, probably quite a bit lower than I should uh, just because I want them to be done. I want the socket graft to be placed in there. I don't want it to be a big, well, I don't know, maybe, maybe not. It comes down to everything's better with more bone. And you know what? Let's put it in there. Let's make sure it's done right. And if your if your extraction fee was a dollar, what would your bone grafting fee be in relationship to? Is it one to one? Is it half to one? Two to one? Uh, it's about it's about two to well, a little under two to one. So it's you know, twice as much money for the bone grafting as it is for the extraction. Yeah, the bone grafting it comes down to yeah for simply yeah, exactly right. It's about right. That's about right. Yeah. And uh, and anything else you want to say about uh, Strawman or the wrap or anything about that? They're fantastic. I mean, in the end, it, it, especially for the younger people watching, it, it, the actual brand of imp, like you said, if it works well in your hands, you can you can use a cheap one, you can use an expensive one, but just know what you're using. You can use multiple ones for that matter. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having multiple different systems in your office. Uh, but as a young dentist, you may not have that availability to you, whether it's your own office or your, your funding uh, you know, they're expensive. So it comes down to, I like the one that, uh, does a little bit of everything, which is, lovely. you know, next time you see your rep, tell your rep, the thing that still blows my mind the most is that noble biocare, Strawman, IT, you know, ITI Strawman, yep. uh, all, um, um, n none of these major companies or even, even Resnick, uh, 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 implants, right. None of them put a 25 to 50 hour from A to Z, how to place implants on dental town and it has 202,000 members and they yeah. took those uh, 250 some courses like half a million times and I mean you would think if you owned a, owned an implant company and you know they have all the courses sure they yeah, do. you know you know they have man. that's been crazy they got, all, they, got the, they got the research they got the development they got everything at their disposal yeah, you should tell your rep that, that that's still the most o overlooked deal and and, 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 well, if, and if I own the company I'd put up um, I'd put up tomorrow um so then the big thing is, what about a CBCT? Did you actually buy one, or do you just have access to one? Because that, that's a big chunk of change. It's a big chunk of change. I've got access to one. We've done everything from, uh, you know, 
I'm in the western suburbs of Chicago. There's actually quite a few around. Specialist friends of mine, uh, uh, them. Uh, there, we've even, I mean, there's even even uh, mobile units you know, that can come by. And actually, the mobile units are sometimes some of the best and most convenient because the patient's already here. They literally walk outside the mobile unit. It's you a use that, huh? You use the mobile yeah. unit. It's been wonderful. Um, you know, not exclusively, and sometimes it's nice to be able to have the the um, the different technologies. Everyone's got different systems and things like that. But truly, the mobile units have been uh, nothing should not be overlooked. Put it that way. What percent of the time when you place an implant do you use the CBCT? Well, for me, my office and my implants consist of pre predominantly uh, one, two, three at a time. Now, maybe occasionally we're crossing the arch, but really a lot of my patients have all their teeth. We're not doing the super large uh, full rehab hybrid type cases I used to do in the past. So it's much more of a converting a bridge to an individual's. Uh, um, for that, oh, it varies. It varies, but the vast majority I, I still don't use. A, a good solid, solid Panorex from our from our Panorex uh, is is really um, is really the, the the mainstay, I'd say. And then of course you have it if you're disposal if you need it. The, the the CBCT can be ordered left and right. And what percent of these? Well, first of all, explain. You said you used to do a lot of complex cases, and now sure. you're doing more. You know, instead of a three and a bridge. Why did you migrate from a lot of complex cases to more um, just not doing a three and a bridge? Well, back before when I was an associate, I was working at an implant center, and uh, that was kind of the genesis of all my surgical, well, my real-world surgical skills, we'll call it. And all we, and we didn't see children. We didn't see anybody at under 18. It was only implants uh, all day long, every day of the year. And, you know, a lot of crown, a lot of bridge, a lot of, a lot of the, all of the process part of it, too. And then, you know, at some point, I kind of missed the variety of, uh, of general dentistry. And so I was able to take that and incorporate that more into the family dentist modality. Uh, the downside, though, is that you know there was always, there's always a pros and a con. You can't necessarily have the same um, focus and experience for the patient, but also the dentist as a surgical center when there's you know when there, when you have to do several, several hygiene checks or there's a, a child down the you know down the hallway that's a little bit upset about getting his teeth clean. It, it doesn't jive that way. So I, I've I've kind of cut back on the larger cases. Because truly, um, in my neck of the woods, that's not the bulk of the cases for me. For every one giant case that comes through, which is really not terribly often, uh, there's a, a dozens of, of, the, of the ones, twos, and threesies that we just put in. And I, I, and I always thought that was the uh, strangest thing about um, dental continuing education is that, you know, you go to a convention, they have like these TMJ courses, and mm -hmm. TMJ is not 1% of the average dentist revenue. And then they have all these cosmetic courses of – Upper 10 veneers, and that's not even 1% of a dentist yeah. revenue. And, and then you go to an implant case, and they're showing all these full mouth reconstructions, and most people in the room, at least half have never done one case ever, and the other yeah. half have only done, you know, they, they count all those cases on one hand. And then when you sit there and say, well, what do dentists do all day long? 96% of crowns are done one tooth at a time. 96% of implants are placed one at a time, and nobody wants to talk about that because oh. it's just not super sexy. And it's not glamorous. That's not sexy. You're right. Yeah. It doesn't sell tickets, but it is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It does. It's the mainstay of it. And you know, especially in a well-controlled, you know, hygiene population, you know, our patients they brush their teeth. Their teeth are great. I mean, initially they they come in off the street, fresh to the office. Maybe they've got to do some work, but you know what? Through a lot of the patient education. And the actual value that you, that you place on not only the, the doctor-patient relationship, but also just their teeth in general. Your teeth are not disposable. They're very important. And your quality of life will suffer unless you start changing things a little bit. And so just by basic tenants like that, which we all try to do, things get pretty stable pretty quickly, and uh, especially, with, especially with effective communication. So when you're placing a – so when 96% of implants get placed, it's one at a time. And you have a tooth in front and a tooth behind. What percent of the time do you use the surgical guide versus just eyeball it and pencil? I'm a, I'm a big surgical guide guy. Um, you know, I, I think it's important. You know, it's how I was trained. Um, I, I really like it quite a bit. It's, you know, I guess you can always freehand it, I suppose. I mean, there's plenty of people out there, but that's just my, my – I'm a big surgical guide kind of guy, especially when you're doing multiple times. But like you said, when you've got one in front, one behind, you know – the angulation and pretty much needs the match. Um, I still like the, and it goes back to the reverse engineering. I want to know where the crown's going to be. And just being able to visualize it in that small piece of plastic 
or acrylic, it means a lot to me. Walk us through your surgical guide. There's so many that people talk yeah. about. I, I, mine aren't anything very complicated. It's uh, essentially, you know, it's, it's, you can make a very quick version of it. There's lots of different kinds, but my, some of my favorite, especially for the simpler single cases, get a, you know, you got a box, a box of old denture teeth. Take your model, uh, pour it all up, place your denture teeth at appropriate size in there, and that's a pretty good approximation about where the tooth's going to be. Get your suck down, uh, get your vacuform material on there, and you've got yourself a wonderful surgical guide that's going to keep your nose pretty clean. So, so you're you're you you're making you, you take upper lower alginates, you pour up the models, you put yeah. a denture tooth there, and then you do a suck down over that. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you drill a hole on the model, or I'll drill a hole, yeah, on the model uh, where I want it, which is nice. And then you can just kind of extend that hole up through the plastic, and then uh, your surgery kind of just becomes, you know, for lack of a better term, it's, it's semi guided. I guess you've already got the desired hole there, and uh, and you just got to match A to B. Very good. And um, what, what do you have any um, favorite uh, implant software from CBT? Uh, if you got a CBT, what, is there a so designing software? Or is that not really a big passion? I don't, have any, I don't have any solid allegiance to this one software. I mean, plus it's changing so often. And, you know, it's not, um, like I said, it's not my, my norm to use it every single time. So I, I don't have a particular allegiance at this point. A lot of um, a lot of uh, people don't want to get a CBCT because they think the half life of the technology is only five years. Well, I agree, and plus it comes down to you know to be truly effective, you're taking a lot of CBCTs on people. Well, I, I mean, I have children in the office, and, and that whole de debate where I'm still again, I'm waiting a little bit more. Let me see a little bit more research on it. Um, whether you're going to extrapolate out, I mean, how wonderful is it that you can take a CBCT of somebody and extrapolate out the, the pan and the, and the bite wings and the and the, you know the full mouth and everything, but with that said, you know I mean it's it's how necessary and more importantly when you're gonna have to buy a new one to stay up with the Joneses. A lot of dentists are um, you know they come out of school two hundred fifty thousand dollars in debt and they're wondering do I need a hundred and fifty fifty thousand dollar CAD cam? What would what would yeah. you say to a uh, kid like that? Do you have one? I don't CAD cam. No, uh, I've got a. I still think the um, the laboratory is of vital vital uh, importance as far as making high-end uh, <clears throat> restorations. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I've got several friends that do wonderful work with CAD CAMs, but you just can't, at least at this, in my opinion, at this point, replace the human element of it all. Uh, they can mill it, they can do it, but it comes down to when you need custom shading, when you, you need somebody there, that's truly an artist in it, uh, especially for the anterior cases. And, and, you know, and I know that's not necessarily for every office because you can do very well with, and, and actually and succeed with you know, the speed and efficiency. A good friend of mine is able to do it in, in half the amount of time that I am, and that's wonderful because the patients truly value that. It's, there's no second appointment. It's, it's, you wait there and you mill it, and, uh, and, and then it's, there's no temporary. And that's really, really nice in some respects. For me, at least right now, I'm looking at the, uh, at the scanners technology as they're coming through. I like the idea of being able to ditch out, uh, at some point, ditch the, uh, the impression material. I think that'll be a really fun day when we no longer have to take, you know, semi-gelatinous goop and gag people just to make a nice crown or a bridge. Uh, being able to be able to be able to do that remotely without any powder or dust, and I know it's it's right around the corner to be really really predictable. Do you, do you mainly use one lab or do you use a half dozen different labs? I mean, no, nah, no, nah, somewhere in between. I've got uh, I use a lab that's for my posterior restorations. I've got one that's kind of for my anteriors. Uh, and my implants, and uh, I've got one that's removable. So I've got actually three. Are they all in Chicago? Yeah, they're all local, yeah. And yeah. I think that's really important, too. I, I really, well, the benefit is I'm in Chicago. I mean, I'm not in the middle of nowhere, and there's just the density of it all. I'm very blessed to have these people literally in my backyard. I mean, several of them are just a couple towns over. And being able to send the patient, all right, Mrs. Jones, you're going to go down to the laboratory. The actual clinician who's going to make your appliance is going to actually you know, draw you and shade you and get everything out. It's a very nice way to do it. Um, and it, it really, it really imparts a lot of, and plus the patient, they love it because they can literally say, I want it to look more like this and like that. And they bring them back for a little shade check. It, it's wonderful service. That takes a lot of the load off my end because when you're dealing with anterior teeth, Hey, it, fit is good, but, but the, the, uh, the, the cosmetics is just as important. Um, our, our podcasts are usually downloaded in 206 countries on every episode. And so the viewers around the world, uh, um, 
Eric actually lives in the city of Chicago where the American Dental Association is. On two, right. 211 Chicago Avenue? Is that? Did I, yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, and uh, I remember that from writing my, my check to Merman. Uh, right. I, I think all the American dentists want to ask you, why does the Chicago Midwinter hold their – I mean, I love Chicago. I think it's one of the yeah. coolest cities in the world. I've been to so many countries. Chicago, New York, San Fran, San Diego. I mean, those are like – San Antonio maybe. Um, but anyway, so why why do they have the Chicago Midwinter in April? Why is it in like Rocky <laughs> Hot – Rocking us in May or yeah. October or around Halloween. Yeah. Why is it February when it's, you know, cause to our viewers around the world, Chicago almost touches uh, Canada. It's way up north, north, and it's on the tip of a lake. So you always have a wind chill factor coming off, and they have it in February. It's like that That would be the exact month I would not have it. Why, why do you think they do that? You think it's just... They like they like the you know maybe it was a little ego thing. Siberia is what they were calling it last year, right? It was uh, about as cold as it gets. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it comes down, I, for me, historically, February, February and September, I guess, are always are a little bit slower months because people are kind of getting back into things, especially with school in September. I imagine that's probably the genesis, but that's just pure speculation on my part. Whenever I ask the old guys, uh, yeah. I, I always get the same answer. We've had it that same weekend, yeah, 1850 something, you know. Before, that's probably uh, more, more accurate than my explanation. Too, I, yeah. I, I think they were having that meeting before the Civil War at that time there, uh, because no one seems to know. Uh, uh, it's, it's always been the same day. So then everybody's wondering: Do you, do you screw your your crowns to implants or not? We keep hearing a lot that one of the biggest causes of periimplantitis is excess cement, and some yeah. implantologists just say they're not cement anymore. Do you do what? What do you What are you doing? I don't. I, I don't – well, see, the thing is, you know, obviously with the screw, you're going to have the, the visible access screw, and then you can use opaquers and things like that. But, but I don't screw, uh, but I do always make a custom abutment. I, I really want that, that uh, cement line up as high as possible away from that implant, just like a natural tooth. So whether it's a, uh, you know, a CAD CAM brand name like Atlantis or, or, or something along those lines, just being able to have a beautiful wide platform that mimics just more or less a perfect ideal crown prep uh, and then you simply just have to clean around the, you know, half millimeter below the gum line, and you're in great, great shape. Very predictable. Uh, obviously, a nice radio opaque cement, so you can see what the heck you're dealing with on the X-rays, and you're in, you're in business. But CAD CAM uh, custom abutments and I go along very well with my implants. I don't, I don't use stock abutments. Eric, how would you answer this? <clears throat> I'm in Phoenix, and there's a dental, two dental schools in my backyard. One's in Glendale, and one's in Mesa. And when they're in my office, the most common question I get is, uh, um. You know, the problem they have with implants is the person who usually lost the tooth um, had decay and gum disease. And, they just, mm -hmm. they're, and they're just thinking, well, what's going to last longer on that missing tooth? The person already has a mouthful of virulent periopathogens, trypticos mutans. And there's a, what would you say to a kid who said, Eric, the person who lost his tooth had a huge cavity and a bleeding five millimeter pocket. And so it's mouth filled with bugs. Yeah. What would last longer, an implant and a crown there, or a three and a bridge? How well, would you explain I mean, that? You, what, what I would tell those, you know, the young dentists would be, it really comes down to what we talked about earlier, a really good comprehensive exam, knowing, you know, is it, has it been 30 years since they're at the dentist? I mean, if they don't have a true value for things, if they don't understand that implants aren't necessarily forever, I mean, you, know, you hear it on the radio all the time with the implants, oh, these, these are forever. Well, they're not, not unless you take care of them. And even then, they, they haven't been around that long in their single rooted form to really be able to make that kind of claim. So that patient better be well educated, uh, certainly as clean as possible going into it. And then it comes down to obviously a lot of patient uh, responsibility. For me, you know, it's funny. I'll have people come to me for implants and I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll joke with them. I'm like, I'm going to talk you out of this implant right now, Mrs. Jones, because you, you need a bridge on that tooth. Whether it's the, they're looking at the space and I'm looking at the space and the neighbors, you know, the two neighbors have uh, 15 pounds of amalgam in them from 1922. It's not going to be a, very long before those need some help too. Why don't you go with the bridge versus Jones, kill two birds with one stone. That's where that, and again, it's, it's full circle. True comprehensive dentistry is multidisciplinary, being able to choose between implant and crown, being able to look at the entire mouth, evaluate the gums evaluate the flora of the mouth, their past histories. It's a very complex, time-consuming appoint appointment. that all happens in that 0150 comprehensive exam. One of my uh, very good friends, they, uh, 
ear, nose, and throat. And uh, you don't want to get them started on sinus lifts. It's going to be going to be a rant yeah. forever. And yeah. I think it's funny how dentists say, "Well, I'll never do a bridge because I don't want to file the enamel off the tooth." And then they'll no. put half a bucket of sand in the person's <laughs> sinus. And then they, my ENT yeah. front buddy Gordon saying, uh, "You know, uh, no, you know, you know, he, you know." So it's funny how a dentist the enamel sacred, but they'll yeah. destroy the sinus. So an ENT is like. Leave the sinus, sinus alone. It's sacred. File down the teeth. And it's funny how everybody has their own perspective. And, and as you get older and older and older, you just realize that binomial thinking is a red flag. When someone says, always yes, always no, up, down, right, not left, whenever you hear an extremist, you know the truth's in the middle somewhere. And, and as you get older and older and older, you get more and more moderate and realize that every question is complex. In fact, when I'm asking you questions, I'm half the time thinking, did I ask that question right? I mean, how you ask the question um, is, is, is everything. You can't, you know, nothing is absolute, right? That's the old saying. And it, it all comes down to, you know, patient care. You know, each patient is different. Each treatment plan is different. You have to know both the physical and the emotional backgrounds. you got to know a little bit of everything to truly get that patient what they want because in the end, and even then, that might be, I, I may have even misspoke, misspoke there. It's what they want and what they need and what they can, what, can they, what you can achieve. All these things kind of come together at the end of that appointment. You know, it's, it's a very, um, it's a very, very interesting thing because, you know, your ENT friend, there's no, there's no one way to do things. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's some definite validity to that opinion. And I'm sure there's some, some definite validity to the dental aspect of it as well. Oh. You, you can, you know, so it comes, it comes down to you're absolutely right. Being able to do it multiple different ways is imperative. One of the things that you're a role model and an idol to me is, um, you know, you're, you're, you, you always have one eye on your patient's needs, but you also have an eye on cost. And, uh, and, and, and you factor that in in a big way. And you're uh, a big part of the CDS Foundation Dental Clinic and the DuPage County Health Department. I want to – and thank you for uh, that. But I want to ask you this. Um, you, you can't even go a month or two, and there's something in the news about mercury. And, yeah. and um, a lot of these young kids are saying, well, you know, what about, you know, amalgams for poor? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's so confusing. Again, it's extremely complex because we know amalgams last at least twice as long as composites. Well, hell, they're, they're anti, they're bacteriostatic. I mean, mercury, yeah. silver, zinc, copper, tin, every one of those is antibacterial to some degree. Um, they're cheaper. Um, but, you know, right now they're um, in San Diego, the, the scientists are talking about, you know, they're finding a lot of mercury in the, the seal lions, uh, their hair, and um, and it's showing up in I think they're saying mollusk, whatever whatever that is. And um, but I read that um, the main mercury contamination for the ocean is burning coal. Coal goes up in the air, goes over the oceans, it settles, and that's the mercury deal. But then some people are pointing out clearly to me that um, somewhere around five or six percent of atmospheric mercury is coming from cremating three million humans a year. And their amalgams are actually going into the vapor. So my question to you is: You're you're uh, you 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 work for the poor. You volunteer for the poor. What 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 do you say to a young kid who says is is being amalgam free? Is that extremist? I mean, what what do you think about amalgam? Do you use it in your office? Do you use it in your clinics? Do you use it at the CDS Foundation Dental Clinic or the DuPage County Health Department? I can only speak from what I kind of believe. I, I don't introduce any new. I always talk with the patients. I don't introduce any new amalgam to the party. You know, am I the one that's harping about you got to get all that out of your mouth, you know, right away? No. Um, but, when, you know, when, it, when I have to remove any, no new, no new amalgam is going in. So I don't place um, – I haven't placed an amalgam fit personally in, in you know, six, ten years. Who knows? Oh, quite a long time. Uh, I'm blessed also you, – you touched on the, 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 uh, the economics of it all. You know, the beautiful part is the, the, the Chicago Dental Society Free Clinic uh, – is such a great organization that they give really a lot of carte blanche autonomy to the, to the providers. If you wish to place an amalgam, go right ahead. They've got it there. If you wish to place only a, a, a resin like I do, you've got it there. You've also got time. You know, you're not put. You know, there's no expectations to put in. You know, 37 fillings in an hour. This, this is not, it's not a race. It's it's you're treating good uh, working class people who are you know are either the working poor or the uh, under the poverty line. And, you know, it's nice because you're able to do it in a way that I would do exactly for the same for my patients and my, my paying patients in my office. So long-winded answer to your question, but I don't introduce any new to the party um, for the same reasons you said. 
there's a lot of question marks out there. And yeah, there are some positives to it, but there are quite a few negatives. And every year that goes by, you know, you got to wonder. And uh, again, no sense in experimenting in people. Uh, plus, in the end, let's be honest, the cosmetics of it all, and people, people don't mind having the nice white matching fillings. It's quite nice. Yeah, you know, every once in a while, I'll hear a dentist always tell me, you know, uh, I, uh, at least once a month, some dentists say, well, I don't, I don't pull teeth or place implants because I, I, I don't like blood and guts. And yeah. I, always, I always think, well, how the hell did you end up in dental school? I mean, you should be I agree. working at Intel. I mean, you know, uh, yeah. you know, my iPhone doesn't have any blood. But I always tell them, you know what, you should, you should then do extractions at crematories because they really need to pass laws that someone needs to go in there and extract those teeth before they cremate right. them. So if you don't like blood and guts, maybe you could be a cremation amalgam extractionist. You know what? You wouldn't have to use a whole lot of Novocaine either. That'd be great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't have to worry about bleeding. Um, yeah. So, Eric, um, another – the thing that I, I, I seriously can't think of a single dentist or a single company that does social media better than you. I mean even the people – we have you. the big companies, and I, I look at their stuff. I mean it's, it's good and everything, but – in all all seriousness, um, yours is the best. My question to you is, are you the one doing all that? Do you outsource that to a company? And has it been a return on investment for you? I mean, is, is it worth it? Do you get new patients from it? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's been a tremendous, uh, a tremendous asset. Yeah, I do everything myself. Um, and it's the old adage. It's, it's write about what you want to read about, you know? I'll write up what if I'm feeling a little bit more uh, surgical. I, I have an office newsletter that I started um, and it's, it's, it's all about, you know, patient education. One more way that I don't have to have a long diatribe with patients while they're here in the office, cause they've got places to go and people to see, but if they really want to learn about how I, and why I do the Invisalign the way I do the Invisalign experience with Dr. Jackson, it's all on the website. You get a fun little video, a fun little this, you know, you pepper the actual things in there that relate directly back to my office. But also the internet is such a wonderful thing. Put a funny, put a funny Pinterest quote up there that you like on Fridays. It's you know it's Friday Fun Day. It's uh, it's uh, you know all the different little things you want, and it's kind of just a reflection of what's in my head, I suppose. And I guess that's a lot of different uh, directions. So if it hits a re if it resonates with uh, someone like yourself, I'm a very happy man, and it's been wonderful. You know, it's just a really great way to disseminate information, deputize, like I said, deputize the, the patients into being a deputy dentist. I mean, I, I really feel like I know you. I mean, I, I feel like from your from your following your social media, I, I, I how long have you been doing it? I mean, since about what would you say, two thousand nine? Yeah, about oh nine. Yeah. Yeah, I've been following you since two thousand nine. I mean, I feel like you're my neighbor. I mean, I feel like I really know you. And that's the whole. I mean, that, that right there. That's why. I mean, what's the best way to get to know your dentist? Well, you can spend a lot of time with them, but that's usually when you're getting work done, and that's fine. But you can absolutely do it just from the comfort of your own phone and just kind of know what goes on in his or her head. Um, plus, you know, it's just, hey, social media costs effort. I mean, I've got people calling me all the time. They want to take over the, this or they want to ghost write for that. And I, that's not me. I want to make sure that the words coming out, out of my mouth are actually the words on, on the page and vice versa. How, so how, it's, how, could, uh, someone, uh, how could someone listening to this right now uh, follow you on social media? Oh, I think, you know, we just recently passed 3,000 Twitter followers. And so I'm, I'm real pleased for a, a local – Downers Grove, you know, outside of Chicago dentist. I think that, I'm remarkably proud of that. What, you what, to, what's uh, your Twitter? At what? At, at E. Jackson DDS. At, uh, at E. Jackson DDS. DDS, yeah. And uh, obviously there's a little bit of everything. It's um, from the YouTube channel to the, uh, you know, Facebook and, and uh, Twitter to, you know, even just a little more obscure things like, you know, LinkedIn. You'd be surprised. I mean, the reps, and I, I'm able to get a hold of a rep like that because sometimes I'll have their card. Sometimes I'll have their LinkedIn account, a quick message, and there you go. They're right there. I mean, they're the business people. We're, we're dentists. We don't really deal with business in a, the same way. But you know what? I don't need an actual business card. I've got your contact information right there, and it's wonderful. You'd be surprised how often they, I get that weird look and said, wow, no one ever follows me on LinkedIn. Yeah, that's important. This is business. We're doing business here. Yeah, and your, your posts are amazing. And, and when I follow your posts, it, you obviously feel – um, you, you're very likable, and oh, and and your um and your your cases and implants. You you just feel like you're going to an authority. You well, you, you. you don't feel like you're going to some kid who doesn't know what they're doing, or some wishy washy, or or someone who's uh, focused on you know insurance or something. You you, you feel yeah. like 
I'm going I'm to go there, and this guy totally knows what's going on, and he's just going to get it done. That's the beauty and the curse of social media. You put yourself out there, and for better or for worse, you're, it's very transparent. And I, you can kind of put the generic uh, pre-made posts from your provider up there, but truly, it's one of those things where I, I prefer the real thing. I want to make sure that that's all correct. You know, that's all, that's all the true representation of me. I, I'm out of time. Or right at 60 minutes, I got one overtime question for you. You mentioned in, in, Invisalign. What, what are your thoughts on Invisalign? And what would you say to someone who says, you know, there's a couple of companies out there doing it. Or you, do you like Invisalign? Have you tried other ones? Um, how, you know, do you think that's a, yeah. a significant part of your practice? You know, it's like everything else. I never have one part of my practice that's more significant. You know, it's um, it, it, it's funny. It comes in cycles. You know, and, you know, you'll get a, get a bunch of implant cases all of a sudden, and then you get a bunch of Invisalign cases all of a sudden, and then you get a bunch of crown and bridge type cases, and it just kind of all ebbs and flows like that. Um, that's what really makes me a very happy general dentist. I like variety. I like being able to dabble in a little of everything. The way I do Invisalign, it's a little bit different. I mean, there's lots of different ways to do it. I don't charge for uh, workups at all. I think it's a really nice service. It's because I'm not, a, uh, I'm not doing a tremendous amount of it. I'll, I'll just enjoy sitting down. Uh, after work and then just work up a case. Uh, then I'll have the patient come on back. And I mean, it's a rare treat to be able to sit down with somebody and say, here's what I think visually you can look and here's what I think your case is going to end up like. Um, what do you think? Because usually, you know, with the orthodontist uh, in non-Invisalign type cases, it's all between the ears. You know, I, I can do that in, uh, you know, nine months, in, in, in two years. But the nice part is being able to really visualize or, or show the patient it means the world. It, it also gives them ownership. They know what's happening. It's no different than a blueprint for, the, uh, for your new house that you're going to build or your office building that you're going to construct. So some, some orthodontists are not shy at all of the fact that they don't think general dentists should be doing ortho. Has your dad ever That's, told you at the dental flavor, son, you shouldn't no. be doing Invisalign? No, because he instilled in me a long time ago that, I mean, and it's very, it's very apparent, Invisalign can't do everything. I'm, I'm very against the Oh, Invisalign can just replace braces. And there's plenty of people out there that, that more or less either say it or, you know, treat like that. Um, you can't do certain movements predictably. That one case that you were able to move, you know, that molar over here to the other side of their face, that's a one in a billion shot. And I'm not going to do one in a billion type procedures on my patients. I want to know nice traditional tipping, twisting, a little bit of extrusion, you know, that kind of thing. Very traditional. So I'm a much more, uh, I'm an old soul when it comes to Invisalign. But the nice part is their technology gets better and better. And when I don't, you know, when I don't uh, think that it can be accomplished with Invisalign, well, then I've got some beautiful specialists, you know, lined up right there down the street. Well, Eric, you said you lecture sometimes at your study clubs and stuff. Yeah, I have. I have. Uh, I, not, I, I, yeah. I, I, if you got an hour of lecture, I'd, I'd give anything to have you uh, put it up on Dental Town. Uh, you can I'd just, love to. Yeah, I, I, I would absolutely love that because I just think you're a hell of a guy. You're a hell of a clinician. You're a hell of a social media. I just think you're a hell of a guy. And I just want to tell you, um, we're two minutes over time, but uh, thank you so much for spending oh, an hour you. with me today. Uh, I, I just think, and uh, thank you for all you do for dentistry and your uh, the CDS Foundation, the DuPage County Health. I mean, everything. You're just a hell of a guy. Thank you so much for spending an hour with me today. It means a lot coming from a guy like you. You know, there's somebody that I've sat in your lectures and your and your MBA for dentistry courses and things. And it's just fantastic uh, being able to sit here. Uh, this is exactly what I wanted to have when I was young, you know, first year out, second year out, being able to rub elbows with somebody, the likes of Howard Ferran or the, the likes of uh, anybody else in that league. I mean, really, we're talking A-list people here. And here I am sitting Skyping with you, and it's fantastic. Ah, thanks, buddy. Well, uh, well thanks, and I hope you have a rocking hot rest of the day. You too. Thank you very much.